Okay, open your Bibles to the book of Titus. We're going to do Titus and Philemon today. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. You're probably hoping we would do that, undoubtedly. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so we'll start with Titus and then we'll do Philemon. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that incredible? All right, so we got, first of all, we'll start with Titus. And then number two, <coughs> do Philemon. Okay, so we'll start here with Titus. We will do uh, introductory, an int excuse me, introduction. And then content. And that's how we'll do it over here also. Alright, so we'll start here with the introduction to the book of Titus. Alright, we'll start with the author then. Who is the author of the book of Titus? Titus, Well, he's self, he, he names himself in verse 1. He says, Paul. Alright, so we understand then that Paul wrote the book of, of the epistle of Titus. <clears throat> he, was, he, had writ, he wrote this shortly after 1 Timothy. So right around the same time as 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. If you remember when we went through First and Second Timothy, First Timothy is very, uh, is very, very much church related, and then Second Timothy is more of a, a personal letter that Paul writes to to Timothy. Although that is that doesn't mean to say that there is nothing doctrinal in those in those letters. But that tends to be the, the case. Titus also, like First Timothy, is very heavily related to church and uh, in, in the order of a church. All right. So the author then is Paul. The theme. <clears throat> like 1 Timothy or similar to 1 Timothy, is church order. We get this from verse 5, chapter 1. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Okay, uh, one thing we could say personally maybe about Titus, of course he's the recipient of the letter, would be Titus, of course, it says it right there. One thing that perhaps we can say about Titus in regards to spiritual gifts is that he likely had the spiritual gift of ruling. That, that we get that because Timothy, or Paul uh, appointed him over the churches to set in order the things that are wanting. Okay? That tends to be somebody that has a spiritual gift of ruling. And they're able to use their gifts to organize and administrate a, a church, or in this case a group of churches in Crete. So he leaves Titus there. We come to the conclusion that's probably his gift. Yes? What was that? Uh, ch verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. Okay. Go through that thing here. Yeah. Okay. So here is what I would say. I guess I'll put it here. I was trying to think of where I should mention it to you, but I'll probably just do it right now. Um, Paul had never, did, didn't start churches in Crete. All right. We um, come to the conclusion that the church there was probably started from, the, from people in the day of Pentecost. All right? So let's go to Acts chapter 2. And verse um, 11. Let's go 10 11. Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya and about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So apparently there are people from Crete at the day of Pentecost, would have been part of the thousands that were saved. Likely they went back to Crete then and probably gathered together in houses and things and, and started their church. Um, ch churches there in Crete. So Crete is an island and it's very close to Italy. Uh, Cyprus is, is closer to, to uh, so if there's the boot. Oops, not very much like a boot. Is it? Let's see. It's more bootish. All right. And then you have Greece here. Israel is here. Uh, Cyprus then is kind of an island right here, and then Crete is right there. And Paul, on his fourth missionary journey, uh, when he was getting to Rome, sailed around here. The Fair Havens are right there, 
And uh, then I think he went to Syracuse, maybe it was up here. I could be wrong about it. Maybe that's here. We could look at a map. You have, if you have a map at the back there, it might show Paul's fourth missionary journey. And if it does, it, this would be considered his, his, a lot of people consider his fourth missionary journey. Yeah, so Crete, no, I'm wrong about that. No, I'm right. Crete, except for the location. Okay, let me, let me redo this. This is over here. Okay. That's Crete. <laughs> I'm going to make it smaller. No, that's Cyprus. All right, this is Cyprus. This is Crete. And the island that was here is actually Sicily. All right, so um, Paul, when he made his journey there, the only, the only thing that we can say about him a landing in Crete was where he landed at the, uh, what are called the fair havens there, and they were there to winter. Okay. So when he was sailing, he sailed here, went here, then he went around here, and he ended up into Rome here. Okay. Very crude drawing, of course, but there you have it. So the only time that we, we know that he was, for sure, that he was in Crete was when he went by here. Now, they were in Crete for some time. It tells us... <coughs> um, in Acts 27, 8 and 9. There it says, And hardly passing it came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Next, next phrase. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because of the fast, uh, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. So they were there for quite a while. And so while they were there, he probably asked about churches. He saw some Christians gathering together in some of the different places there in Crete and uh, went and spoke to some of those organizations, realized there were a lot of things wanting, lacking in Crete. And so when they left again, being in Rome, uh, then he sends this letter to Titus. And he actually, excuse me, he doesn't send a letter to Titus. He, he leaves Titus here. And uh, so probably Titus was traveling with him, leaves him here uh, to take care of those things. Then he goes back here, writes the letter, has it sent back to Titus again. And he is encouraging then Titus in setting in order the things that are in Crete. That's basically probably the best we understand it as to what happens, the way I understand it. Okay, so he wants Titus to stay there in Crete. So going back to the book of Titus. All right, so church order. What did, he, what did Paul see when he went to Crete? Well, he saw a bunch of Christians getting together, but there were a lot of things that were lacking. It, it was, if, if Titus had to set things in order, then we assume that these assemblies were disorderly to some degree. Okay? That doesn't mean that they didn't have safe people there. There were just some things that they maybe they didn't know. Probably that was it. They were just all ignorant of a lot of things. They probably only had, they only understood, uh, well, they, they understood the, the teaching of, of God's Spirit. Whatever it is they received, at Pentecost and then some of their travels as, as some Christians went through is what they knew, right? Some of the deeper understanding and precise understanding of the church and all that they didn't have. And so it was Titus's job, appointed by Paul there, to, to make sure that these churches understand this, all right? So that's the way I see it uh, has, has come about. Well, a couple things about, about Titus himself, all right? So we're still in the introduction here. A couple things about the recipient of this letter. As I mentioned, he probably had the gift of ruling. And also, he was a Gentile, uh, completely Gentile. We see this from Galatians 2, 3, when it mentions that Titus, unlike Timothy, uh, was not urged or, or, or uh, directed to go through the rite of circumcision. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So he was a Gentile, Greek here. He was definitely one of Paul's converts. He says in verse 4 of chapter 1, Titus 1, 4, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. If we go to 1 Timothy, which is right here, we see that uh, Paul, uh, excuse me, verse 2 there, unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith. He also says that of Titus, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith. So likely, both Timothy and Titus were led to the Lord by Paul. Right? So they became uh, laborers, co-laborers with him. All right, so Titus was a Gentile, was one of Paul's converts. He was mentioned, he's mentioned in a couple of different books. We just saw that in Galatians, but he's also mentioned in 2 Corinthians. All right, so in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, 
I had no rest in my spirit. Now, you, you might remember some of these things when we went through 2 Corinthians. We talked about, oh, we talked about Titus because remember, let me help you to remember. The, um, he sent the first letter, he sent 1 Corinthians, right? Then he wanted to hear how the church had received that letter of 1 Corinthians. So he was waiting for Titus to come back again. And Titus was going to tell him of how that church received it. So in 2 Corinthians then, uh, he finally, Titus does come back and he begins to write 2 Corinthians in such a way where he now understands how they received that letter. And then he tries to get the, um, the, the, the people uh, in, um, it's in Corinth here to send a, a gift of money to the church of Jerusalem, probably sent there by the hand of, of Titus himself. So that's kind of what happened. That's what we see him here. And he comes to prominence then in 2 Corinthians. If we look in uh, chapter 7, well, he's in chapter 2, but it just mentions there, uh, in verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus. So he's just saying here that he expected to find Titus, but did not. It isn't until chapter 7, verse 6, Nevertheless, God that com comforteth, comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though it were but for a season. All right, so uh, he's mentioned there in 2 Corinthians. He's mentioned in Galatians. These letters then have Titus. He appears there. Now, I mentioned that. All right, he delivered a second look. I mentioned that too. Um, actually, I probably should read that one. But uh, So he delivered that second letter to them. We see that in 2 Corinthians 8.23, where it says, Whether any of you do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you or our brethren be inquired of, that they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. So we come to the conclusion that Titus likely delivered the 2 Corinthians letter to Corinth. All right, so Paul had a lot of people traveling for him. He, he's in prison, he can't do very much. He's, we're going to see with Philemon too, that he tells Philemon to come back and to visit him again uh, after, after a time. Same thing with Titus. All right, so lots of, uh, lots of organization that's being done here. So Titus was used of, of Paul, and he was a servant there. Now, what, what, uh, what was going on with Titus? So Titus is left there in Crete. Now, if you can imagine, just put yourself in his shoes for a minute. He's traveling with Paul, comes to the, to, to the island of Crete, and Paul sees some things that are necessary. He can't stay because he's bound to go to Rome, okay? So he sees that somebody's got to stay on his behalf. He tries to find somebody that, that can best fit the job. Well, if, it's, if these churches are disorderly and they need to have an orderliness put there, he's trying to look for somebody that has the gift to be able to do that. He sees it in Titus, suggests that Titus stay here. All right, now... What we understand from the Bible, the Cretans were not super nice. I don't know. They were liars, okay? They were lazy, that kind of thing. We see that in the Bible. So he's dealing with those people, and he's trying to put things in order. It wasn't very easy for Titus, okay? It wasn't very simple. So when Paul gets to Rome, he decides he needs to write a letter back to Titus to encourage him a little bit. This is what we see here. Uh, if we look at verse... Uh, one, let's see, one, five, of course, things that are wanting. Uh, yeah, so a lot of different things. He tells Timothy a very similar thing, that things were not very, simp uh, very, very easy. In fact, he says um, in, in verse uh, 16... Yeah, in verse, uh, chapter 1 here, verse uh, 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, Evil beasts and slow bellies. Okay. <laughs> so the digestive tract was not very quick. Right? It took them a while to digest food because they were slow bellies. So they would eat some. It took them a real long time. So they had to sit around for a long time until they could digest. You know? So they got full and they just had to, just to crash for a while. And that's what I get <laughs> from that. And so there were liars, evil beasts. I mean, I don't think that these are complimentary. Somebody called you an evil beast. <laughs> well, thank you. I, <laughs> I can't remember the last time somebody gave me such a tremendous compliment. Probably not. All right, liars, people be. So this is about what we do see, is these are the kind of people that Titus is, is dealing with. And then what does Paul say? Paul could have said, no, nah, that's not true. That's ah, not true about the creations. Don't you worry about it. The next verse, he says, this witness is true. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks a lot. Okay, people are saying these creations are awful people. And you know what? That's true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, <coughs> that they may be sound in the faith. <coughs> not giving <coughs> heed to Jewish fables 
and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So we're trying to get an understanding of what Titus is going through. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Okay, so apparently these people had defiled minds. They profess they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work ret reprobate. Probably not the easiest mission field, if you will. Okay, was Crete. But that's where he was, and so he's trying to uh, encourage him. Lots of things are wanting. The people there aren't the easiest to work with. They need a lot of teaches, a lot of teaching. It, undoubtedly, with that description of the people, no wonder the churches were disorderly. All right, so we get a, look, a little bit of understanding. Titus is going through it. Okay, it's a little bit tough, and so Paul here is trying to encourage him. All right, so let's look at like, the purposes then. We're still with the introduction here. <clears throat> already gone through some of those. We'll go ahead and officially list them. All right, so... Uh, it is very similar to 2 Timothy. That, so the purpose then is to encourage Titus. I already mentioned that, but we'll just go ahead and officially list that there. And so it's very much like 2 Timothy. He's admonishing, uh, admonishment and help and encouragement to a young person concerning the work uh, that he's doing there. All right? So he's trying to ordain these. So that's one of the reasons. Um, yeah, okay, I mentioned all that. And then... So it's, he's uh, helping him there, and he's urging Titus to, um, to use a common vernacular, to, to stick it out, to stay there, all right, and not, not, not to leave. He seems to have been through a difficult, if you look at, uh, ver, yeah, all right, so we already looked at that. All right, so that's along the same kind of thing. You know, along this, we can understand some things. What did Paul see um, about, what, was, he, was he carrying... Uh, about Titus or about the Cretans or about both you know what what when he looked at the Cretan people and he looked at Titus's ministry what did Paul see I think he saw in Titus somebody that could that could do the job somebody that had that gift but I think he saw in the Cretan people people that needed Titus okay they needed somebody like that and he was probably Paul was probably thanking the Lord that Titus was there and was willing to do it and had that gift um, and so the difficulty he's going through is not uncommon anybody that's really done anything worth doing has gone through difficulty that's just that goes with the territory okay you can't i know <laughs> this is typically prevalent maybe it's been in every generation but it's typically prevalent in yours you want to start at the top well it doesn't work that way okay you've got to work your way up you start at the bottom you prove yourself and then you work your way up that's just how it is that's part of life so titus needed to have encouragement to, to do it that way um, it's easy to go and try to try to uh, uh, evangelize a place that people aren't antagonistic against the gospel. I I was in in the South for nine years, and in there everybody's saved. I don't know if you've been in the South, but everybody's saved. And uh, every, ma many people go to church, and a lot of them are Southern Baptist Southern Baptist churches. Many of them, in fact, the, the city of Jackson where we were at is a Southern Baptist stronghold. The Union University is there, which is a Southern Baptist university. And in fact, Eddie Ray went to school there. He went to school there. He had started off a Southern Baptist. Um, he, he is totally not that way anymore at all, but he did start off that way. So it's a little bit easier in some ways to minister there because people aren't antagonistic against it. The problem there is trying to convince people that they're not saved. But it's easy in, in regards to uh, confrontation. You don't have a whole lot of rude confrontations there, okay? More so you would have that up here. Um, but do more people get saved down there than here? I don't think so. It's just the way that the people are. So Titus didn't go to the south, as it were. He was going to a difficult place. What, what sort of people were in these churches? Actually, there seems to be lots of people. If you look at chapter 2, he mentions there were aged men, there were aged women, there were young women, there were young men. And he even, he even says, uh, uh, he even talks about himself personally in verse 7. So lots of different age groups that, he, that, that Titus is expected to, to minister to, and also servants, it says in verse 9 of chapter 2, exhort servants to be obedient. So what I'm trying to give you in this introduction is an understanding, a little bit of a, a kind of the flow of the book, what's, what's going on there. All right? So try to put yourself in, in Titus' shoes. There are a lot of people that are needy, um, you know, poor, difficult, uh, probably... Um, you know, so what is it, for example, let's just use, for example, young women, right? Verse 4, that they may teach young women to be sober, 
So apparently, part of the disorderliness that he found is that there were a lot of young women that were not sober. What is sober? What does that mean? I mean, it's not drunkards, it's not that kind of thing, but what is it? Clear-minded. Yeah, or, or serious, mature, okay? So there were, there were a bunch of immature young ladies there. Uh, to love their husbands, to love each other. When we're talking about young ladies, we're not talking about maybe your, your age young, but young married ladies. And, uh, and be sober. Not that you shouldn't be sober. I'm just saying. To love, you're, you're off the hook. You can be as silly as you want to be. To love their husbands, to love their children. So there must have been a lack of that. To be discreet. What does discreet mean? I would say careful about what you... Yeah, use discretion. Yeah, of course. And uh, maybe careful about what you say. Careful about how you say things. All right? Apparently, they were wagging tongues, perhaps. That sort of thing. To be discreet. Chaste. All right, pure. Presenting yourself, uh, possessing your vessel with honor. Keepers at home. Good. Obedient to their own husbands. And the word of God being not blasphemed. So... Paul saw the word of God being blasphemed, is the way he said it, by the, partly, now they're not the only ones, but partly by the behavior of these young women. I just looked down and saw young women there and picked it. But it could have been any of these age groups. Okay? So Titus had a lot of work to do, a lot of preaching to do, a lot of teaching, a lot of help. And, and uh, so what would you think if you were to go through what he did? He's just traveling with Paul, trying to be a servant any way he can. He probably thought to himself, well, he had probably had in his mind what he'd like to do, and probably staying at Crete and dealing with these people was not part of it. <laughs> probably. All right. But that's what uh, he was given to do. So um, Paul, through the graciousness of the Lord, writes this letter to Titus, try to encourage him. So the Lord needs churches, uh, people in churches, excuse me, the world needs peoples in church, people in churches to do the Lord's work and to teach and to preach. That's very important. Each, each church, as a good church, is a lighthouse. And is a, is a blessing and a need. It fulfills the need that any community might have. Um, and th there are people that need to, to go to tough places, difficult places. That's just what it is. Okay, People have got to go there just like anywhere else. And there's got to be somebody that, that does it. So you see, when you think of it that way, and when you think of, well, we could talk about the mission field and that's fine. But even here in, this, in, in our country, it's a mission field in, in every respect that any other one is. If you've been to the mission, mission field before, what do they do in the mission field? They do the same thing that we do here. It's no different. It's no different at all. Some way we have this glamorous view of things, but the truth is, it's exactly the same thing. And uh, so, uh, all, all people need this. It's, it's a huge demand that the Lord puts on a church uh, to do that, and we have to be about His business. And so that's true in Creed, just like it would be for anywhere else. And so. Uh, he says, we'll kind of close this thing with Titus by looking at 3.12, where there it says, When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. So he prepares things beforehand. He says that when you're done with all of this, I'm going to be wintering in Nicopolis, so, so you stay here. So, so how long then was Titus there? Likely about a year. Because if he stayed at the, stayed at the uh, fair havens there, and we know from Acts 27 that that was during the winter time. So then if he's going to winter in Nicopolis the next winter, Titus was there for about a year, right? And then after that time, then he tells, he tells Titus, I want you to go to meet me in Nicopolis, probably because he wanted to hear what, about what was going on or whatever the case may be. So he had to plan this. Now, nowadays, you don't have to plan things so much because you just have a cell phone, right? But I can remember the days when there weren't any cell phones and you actually had to, if you can imagine that, you actually had to tell somebody what time you're going to be somewhere and to meet him there. It, it all revolved around that and you had to be there. Okay, so you might say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you here at this time. Okay, good. But you had to plan all those things beforehand. We don't think that way anymore because we've got cell phones. All we, all we say is, I'll text you or I'll call you. So there's no planning really involved. It kind of takes you out of this necessity to have to be somewhere at a certain time because you just called. And if you're going to be late, what do you do? Just shoot a text. You don't have to talk to them. You can just text them. And so it wasn't that way back then. Because back then, the truth of the matter is, you were actually leaving somebody wait for you. It, there was more of a sense of that, okay? Because you knew somebody's waiting for me at this place right here, and as the minutes go by, you're rushing to get there. They're sitting there. You know they're sitting there waiting for you, or you hope. That's the way things were. Also, I can remember back then, too, uh, people looked out for one another because there wasn't this ability. You know, now when you see a car on the side of the road, I, always, I think to myself now, well, they've got a cell phone. They'll call somebody, right? But back then, it wasn't that way. So you kind of help one another a lot more because they're, they're truly abandoned. If, you're, if your car is stuck in the middle of the highway 
and you don't have a cell phone, no way to communicate, you are truly stuck there. <laughs> you got so there was a lot more uh, helping one another and that kind of thing. And even this would be another thing that's probably crazy to you, but in, when I was a kid going to school, everybody walked to school. Everybody. There were no school buses. <laughs> You're kind of like, really? Yeah, there were no school buses. I'm not saying they didn't exist, but all of us just walked. So in the morning, all these kids are walking down the streets going to school. And uh, so the, the community would watch out for one another. They knew the kids were out there. They knew those kids had no way you know, to communicate or anything, so they'd watch out for one another. There was more of a sense of community and watching out for one another. But I think cell phones to a large degree has destroyed all of that. Anyway, I, I, that's why Paul here is trying to, to, to help Titus to understand those things. Okay, a couple of statistics then. We'll finish our, our um, introduction this way. Um, see, I, let me just say one more thing. I, I see myself a lot of times as a, your, I, this is weird for me to think this way, but the truth of the matter is I am your link to the past. That's weird for me to think that way. <laughs> I don't think like I am, but I've come to realize that I am. And it's good to, to, for you to hear how things were done. Um, some things were not done so well, some things were, but it's good for you to have people around that can link that thing with you, for you. Just like for me, it's good to have that too. Okay, so some statistics. The book of Titus is the 56th book of the Bible. These are just, you know, I don't know. I might ask a uh, multiple choice. Question. Which of these things is not true for the book of Titus? I don't know. Maybe something like that. It has three chapters. 46 verses. Anybody guess how many words there are? I'm going to take a stab at it. If I had a piece of candy, I'd give one to the one that was closest. If I don't. I do have chalk if you want to eat that. 1,000? 1,320. Okay. 1,320? Okay. <laughs> Might as well get the units digit there too. All right. Just take a guess. We're just having fun waking up a little bit. 1,497. All right. Two more guesses. What did you say? 1,320? 1,320. 1,130. 1130. Okay. One more. Cool. I, want, I want your guess. The answer is 921. <laughs> so I think Jessica is the closest, right? Chalk. Yep, get her a chalk. That's right. Uh, another thing about the Book of Titus, there are no questions. Paul doesn't ask one single question in this entire book. Three chapters. Now you say, what difference does that make? Well, I think it does. If, if somebody's not asking questions because they have a lot to say, they're, they're not trying to use that method at all. They're, they're stating things. And how much of these uh, of the verses we have here are historical? Actually, 45 verses of history. It's all historical, really, because it deals with those things. And there's one verse of unfulfilled prophecy. Chapter 3, verse 7, that being justified by His grace, we shall be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Interesting statistics. Okay, let's get into the content then of Titus. Okay, so here in the content now, first thing we'll, we'll talk about is Titus and the uh, leaders. Titus and and the leaders. Okay, we'll go there. There's going to be three things. We'll start here, and then we'll do number two and three. If I get to two and three and forget to put it right down here, somebody let me know because the video people are going to want to know that. Okay, so Paul, what is he called? Three, uh, see, four titles for Paul. All right, and we'll we'll extend some understanding for this. So, what does he call himself in verse chapter one, verse one? It says Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. So he sees himself as a servant. This word in the Greek for servant actually means a bond slave. So he's a bond slave of God. So how did Paul see himself as a servant? In fact, in, in truth, a bond slave. A bond. What is a bond slave? What is that? That's a that's a slave or a, that has been purchased. Okay. So somebody bought, bought this person to be a slave for them. That's the way Paul saw himself in, 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 the, in the case of, of Christ there. He saw himself as a slave, a bought slave. As if there was a slave market and he was chosen to be, and was purchased and was put in there. Just like that. That's the way he saw himself. 
Secondly, he is called, and here we see this again, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We've mentioned many times before, it was important for these men to, to, um, to give the authentication of their apostleship because they were giving us God's word. That was an important thing. In verse 3 of chapter 1, he is called a preacher of the word, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. So he's a preacher of the word. And I saw a bond slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, a preacher of the word, and then we mentioned this before, a spiritual father to Titus. So he, there's a wide range. Slavery, apostleship, preacher, father. So he calls himself all of these things. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask this. What is... Um, he, he uses the word preach as opposed to teach. Is there a difference? The difference between preaching and teaching. Now, if you say yes, I'm going to ask you what the difference is. So, You say no? Would you say that preaching is teaching, but teaching is not preaching? You would say that? Really? Okay, what else? <laughs> ben, you look like you want to say something. No? You have nothing to say? What's the difference? Preaching usually involves teaching, but preaching usually um, focuses on one, on one point or area and um, is more personal, whereas teaching is just more or less like information. Okay. Uh -huh. Personal, you mean uh, you're, you're trying to get people to make a decision? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to look at it. When, when you're preaching, you're driving at people making a decision. We say that after you get done preaching, people should be mad, sad, or glad when you get done. And, and that's because that's what you're aiming for. Okay, you're looking for a decision. That's why it's more, it's more proclaiming. It's not really two ways, it's one way. It's from the, the pulpit to the pew. And um, the, the results of, of good preaching is uh, it, it, it causes people to want to do something for the Lord. Okay. Now, teaching, on the other hand, allows them the knowledge to be able to do that. So the best way I've, I've used to, to show this is that if, if you were my army and uh, there was an enemy right over a hill, say over there, and I'm the, I'm the general and I want to equip all of you. So I give all of you M2 Browning uh, 50 caliber submachine guns with a tripod. You can mount them on a, so whatever. And, or you can hold them like this, although you'll, you'll be in pain, <laughs> but you could do that. So uh, I give them all to you, and you're, there you go. There's Rebecca with her M2 Browning, and she's going to it. <laughs> and so uh, you're charged to go. You're excited about going because you've been, you've, you've, you've been preached to. So like, yeah, let's do this thing. But then you get there, and you have no idea how to use the M2 Browning. <laughs> you go, oh, yeah, I don't know how to use this thing. So teaching helps you to be able to use it, use that thing. It shows you how to do it, and preaching gives you desire to want to do it. So a congregation that has a lot of teaching, a little preaching, is, is, wants to do something but has no idea how to do it, falls on their face. On, on the other hand, a congregation that goes through a lot of teaching and not so much preaching, love to sit around and talk about the deep things of God, but they don't want to get up and reach, and reach this, the lost. Okay, so it takes both. Both things are equally important. You, you would probably agree that most of the Great Commission deals with teaching. It's teaching, showing those things. Um, but both things are important. And he tells Timothy, preach the word. So in, in particular, it's Timothy and Titus. What he saw, in, in, in certainly in Crete here, was they needed, they needed some preaching. All right, so that's, that's uh, Titus and leaders. So that's, we're here. So that's Paul, all right, what he calls himself. And then the elders. Uh, verse 15 and 16 says, unto the pure, all things are pure. Excuse me. Not 15, 16, 5 through 16. All right, so verses 1 through 4 would be kind of be Paul. Um, so Titus and the leaders, so who are one of Titus's leaders? I guess that's the point here is Paul. And then some of the other leaders we see in verses 5 through 16. So very, very similar to 1 Timothy 3, where he gives the qualifications. Here are their qualifications also, verses 5 through 9. Thou should have set in order the things that are wanting <clears throat> and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. So, so part of the thing with Titus was he had Paul as his, as his leader, but then he's also to appoint leaders. And not just anybody. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, 
not given a wine striker, not given a filthy lucre, a, a, a lover of hospitality, good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast a faithful word. Now we can go through each of these things, okay, but this is kind of more of a survey class. And what is important to understand overall here is that Titus wasn't just to pick anybody. They had to be careful about who he chose as elders over these churches. What, what did Paul maybe see? when he saw these churches in Crete. Either he saw nobody over them, or the people that were over them probably weren't very qualified. So this was part of the disorderliness. All right, so there is a qualifications there. What kind of things, <clears throat> excuse me, was Titus to teach these elders that they were to do? All right, uh, three things I see. So the duties, you might say, of elders here. So what are the duties? So Titus was to... Um, Take the advice of Paul, who was a preacher and apostle and all that, and he was to appoint these elders, and they had qualifications. Then he was supposed to teach these elders what they were to do. What are some of those things? Well, if you look at verse 9, it says, Holding fast the faithful word. So hold fast to the word. What that word, hold fast, is actually a, um, has the idea of adhering to. Adhering to oneself. So in the Greek there, it has a reflexive meaning. Adhering to oneself. Okay? Um, so it would be like gluing, I guess we would say that maybe, gluing to yourself. So pulling into yourself, all right, and gluing yourself. So that's the way the leaders are supposed to look at God's word. That word hold fast is a very picturesque word. Then secondly, they were supposed to exhort the believers. In verse 9 there it says, to exhort, and hath been taught, at, at, that he may be able to, uh, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. All right, so it's supposed to exhort that is encourage, and then also to convince the gainsayers. And he was supposed to do it through doctrine. Interesting. Sound doctrine. So Paul suggests that Titus, if you're going to deal with these people that, are, that need, need encouragement, those can be good people, then if you're going to convince these people who are called gainsayers, you've got to teach them doctrine. Doctrine is the thing that straightens all those <laughs> things out. The word gainsayers is kind of an interesting word. Um, it is the word... Antilego. I didn't write it in Greek, but that's what it looks like. The word lego means I speak. What is anti? That's a, that's a prefix that we use in English. What does that mean? Against. Yeah, against, exactly. Yeah. So if this is I speak or speaking, what does anti lego mean? It means somebody that is a, a, pre, a person that speaks against. Okay, so these gainsayers are people that uh, oppose. I guess we could say that, the best way to look at that. People that oppose. So Titus is trying to do something, and in the congregation there are people that are opposing him. Hecklers, people that talk behind his back saying, no, that's not okay. So look, how, how are those people going supposed to be convinced of these truths? Doctrine. Okay, that's what he says there. All right, now let's look at Titus in the church. Okay, so we're here. Titus in the church. <clears throat> so we'll look at the people of the church, the savior of the church, and the responsibilities of the church. So first of all, the, the people. We've looked at this already. What are some of the, is this in chapter 2, what are some of the different groups of people he says to deal with? It says, aged men, that they be sober. That's interesting. He says that of uh, all of these groups, except for the aged women. It's interesting. So he says that the aged men be sober, young women be sober. We said that in young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So the only ones they don't, they, he doesn't suggest as the aged women. Interesting. I don't know why necessarily, but it's a point to bring up. And so the aged men there, yes? What did you mean by didn't suggest? Is, in verse Is it there? Did I miss it? Aged women likewise, that they be in behavior. Nothing about sobriety, though. I guess that's what, that's what I meant. Oh, okay. It doesn't use the word sober. <clears throat> so, but these different groups... What, is that, what does that say to you and I? So he's got aged women, aged men, younger women, younger men, and then servants. So those are the groups he's told to deal with. Why does he distinguish these groups? Isn't God's word for everybody? Why does he say specifically, deal with the aged men this way, deal with the aged women this way, and so forth? Yeah, they have different roles. In the, in the church? So they're to be taught differently, is that what you mean? Or even at home? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have different things, or different responsibilities, and... Yeah, certainly that's true, isn't it? Um, 
So there, there are levels, aren't there? And, and God's Word always brings that out. The aged men are to teach the young men, the aged women, the young women. And so there's an order to things in the church. There's an order to, to all of this, all right? Um, and that order needs to be there. So when, when the younger uh, rise up and think they know more than the aged, there's problems there. And when the aged look too much down upon the young, there's also problems there, okay? So they, they have a role on both. And they're supposed to be, uh, the age are supposed to lovingly bring along those that are young. The young are supposed to, to take that. So this is, the, this is God's order. It's, it's His order in the home. It's His order in the church. It's His order everywhere. All right, so Titus had to set these things in order. Undoubtedly, there were some things in, in the churches at Crete that were not done this way. All right, then he exalts the Savior uh, of, of the church, which, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see this in, in, in really the rest of the uh, chapter and all the way through chapter 3. So I'll just read it. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying God, uh, ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteous, there it is, soberly again, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you suppose in, in verse 13 that Paul is exalting the Lord Jesus to be God himself? Is that clear to you? What does he say? That the great God and our Savior? Pretty clear there, isn't it? It's a proclamation of the deity of Christ. The critical texts uh, mess up that verse often. Who gave, yes. Yeah, sure. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all... I thought there was some here. All iniquity. Um, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. So all of you are supposed to be weird. Zealous of good works, which I don't find a problem with most, so that's fine. Things, these things speak and exhort and rebuke all authority. So he says, speak them, exhort, and rebuke. So all three things would be done, not, o not overweighing one over another. So I think speak, just simply teach, show, exhort, encourage, and then rebuke, correct. Right? So n not one thing outweighing the other. It's kind of like a, it's a balance. Let no man despise thee. In other words, don't do anything that would cause somebody to despise you. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities of power, so obey magistrates and so forth. Speak no man. So there, there you have it. Is, um, in verse 4 through 7, by the way, there's more exaltation of the Lord. Uh, the, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay, a lot of doctrine on... I don't have time to go into all of this. Again, I have to remind myself it's a survey course, but lots of New Testament theology in that verse right there. This idea of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Um, that this is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy in Ezekiel 36, and, and this was followed through in Acts chapter 2. Anyway, in the prophecy of Joel, there's lots of things we could talk about, but he's, he's exalting Christ, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So when he's dealing with Titus, <coughs> excuse me, Titus in the church, one of the things he, he says to Titus is you've got to teach doctrine. That's going to straighten things out. You've got to teach these different groups, and they have different needs. So, and you've got to teach them in such a way that you're speaking to some, you're exhorting some, you're encouraging others. And, and, and teach the proper doctrine of Christ. I think certainly that's the case there. And then the responsibilities of the church. All right, we'll, we'll, a few more notes, and we'll take a break. Uh, excuse me, so this would be Titus and the church. Uh, the, excuse me. Uh, oh, this is still underneath here. Sorry, all right. So we, we talked about the people in the church, the Savior of the church, now the responsibilities of the church itself. All right, so one, two, three, four, five things, and they're all in, verse, in, in, in chapter 3. He tells the church, verse 1, put them in mind, to the churches, I guess you could say in Crete, to put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates and to be ready to every and to be ready to every good work. Right? This idea of, of uh, subjection, that's a military term. Okay, it means keep rank. That's the idea of, of subjection. So in the military, you, they've got their rank insignia right on there. You know, there's no question as to what their rank is. Right? You can't unless you took somebody else's coat with a higher rank and walked around. I suppose that's possible. But if you ever got caught, <laughs> so um, you don't want to do that, believe me. But so you salute too. There's this idea of saluting. Um, when you are an officer in the military, you salute 
you have to return the salute of everybody that's, that's below you and you have to salute everybody that's above you. So an officer is saluting everybody that they see. Uh, as an enlisted person like I was, you don't have to salute anybody in the enlisted ranks. So if you were among the enlisted ranks, you don't have to worry about that. But with officers, that's the case. You even had to salute cars that had officers in them. They had stickers. An enlisted sticker was red and an officer sticker was blue. So if the sticker was blue, you had to salute the car. But you can't just salute in any way. There was a particular way you had to do it. When they are within, I think it was, I forget now, but I think 10 paces, you start your salute and you leave it there and you have to stop walking. You can keep walking, but you have to leave it there. They salute you and until they drop their salute, you don't drop yours, you leave it up there. Okay? And then they drop theirs and then you drop yours. Very particular way to do it. Now, if they disregard you and they're busy and they don't see you, well, then you just drop it after you pass them. Which happens a lot. Also, when they, have, when they play uh, Reveille or Colors, that is the beginning and the end of the day, you have to stop where you are, face the flag, and salute until the very last note. So there's a very structured way to do things, okay? And your, your, um, this idea of subject to powers has the idea that understand where your place is in rank and keep that, keep that place. That place is important, okay? The, the, the ones that are low and the ones that are high, every single place there is important. And you have to just have to keep that place. Somebody has to do it. Okay, so subject to principalities of power. Secondly, initiate good works. To be ready to every good work. Okay, look for good things to do. Search them out. Be diligent to look for good, for a way to be a blessing. You should do that. We should all do that. We should look at people and ask the Lord, does this person need something? Can I be a help to them? And then maintain good works. In verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works, maintenance of good works. So he's saying, church, you make sure you stay subject. I wonder if the churches there didn't have this problem. Initiate good works, maintain good works. This one I'm sure they did. Avoid foolish questions, verse 9, but avoid foolish questions. It says right there, and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. When it deals with genealogies, this is the, uh, uh, the idea of uh, having a, a, well, a genealogy or a lineage or a pedigree, okay? As they would argue these things. It's pointless. And then reject a heresy. Verse 9. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. So a heretic is supposed to be admonished one time, and if they continue that heresy, they're to be rejected. All right, and then lastly, real quick, Titus in the future. All right, so it's Titus... And the future. So we already said he, he was supposed to go to Paul in Nicopolis to winter there. But then he was also supposed to bring Apollos. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey diligently. Let nothing be wanting unto them. So they were supposed to send these people to Paul when they came through and it's supposed to help them. So give them what they needed. And then in verse 14, uh, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses. They be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them, with a love, with, greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay, we'll begin Philemon after a break. Okay, I think that's all of us. Let's get started then. Introductory material for Philemon. The author again is Paul. It says in the verse, verse, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. All right, so it's written by Paul to Philemon. This uh, very small epistle, it is the smallest, is a prison epistle. So this we, we lump with Philippians, Colossians, and Ephesians. It's probably written during uh, Paul's uh, imprisonment. Okay, it is the shortest of Paul's epistles. And many people date this epistle around AD 60, which is pretty early, really, as far as epistles go because he probably wrote this at his first imprisonment. We know that there were a couple of them. So when, these are the books he wrote in his first time. There, there seems to be two different kinds of, of, I say kinds, and that's why we think there are two different times. He was in prison in Rome, but he had the freedom to go out. He, he had his own hired house, he received people and all of that. But the second, another imprisonment doesn't seem that way. 
So this was probably during his first one, and that's why he put it around AD 60. All right, what is the theme? The theme is love and forgiveness. Actually, the word, the name Philemon has to do with love. I think lover of me, Philemon. If it's Greek, it'd be philas, philasmon. Um, see, ego, emu, emu, eme. Yeah, something like that. All right, so love and forgiveness. Paul intercedes here on behalf of somebody named Onesimus. All right, let me see that in verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. All right, so this person, Onesimus, who was that? In Colossians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, Okay, there Onesimus is mentioned. It says, With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister, son to Barnabas, touching whom ye have received commandment. If ye come unto you, receive him. So Onesimus then is seen here as a part of the church of Colossae. So, of course, the book, the um, uh, letter to Colossians was written afterwards. This is another reason why we put Philemon at an earlier date. So he mentioned Onesimus there, and Onesimus apparently became a church member in the church of Colossae. All right, now what of this person? And we know some things about Colossians. In chapter 1, verse 2, it says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ Jesus, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says in chapter 2, verse 1, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, for as many as I as have not seen my face in the flesh. We come to the conclusion that very likely Paul never had visited the church at Colossae that he wrote to. Okay, this brings in sort of a paradox, because if Onesimus is a church member in Colossae, and if Paul was never in Colossae, how does Paul know Onesimus? And for that matter, how does he know Philemon? Okay, so these are a couple of things we need to try to answer. Um, Apparently, now we can answer the one how he knows Onesimus, is because probably Onesimus, not probably, but here in the book of Phi, in the epistle to Philemon, Onesimus had done something wrong against Philemon. Probably Onesimus was a servant of his. He did something wrong. It doesn't tell us. Um, it says in verse 11, which in time past was to the unprofitable, but now profitable to the end to me. He doesn't mention what that unprofitableness is, but apparently it was something that was pretty bad. It was fairly bad. In fact, so much so that likely Onesimus fled to Rome and was there captured or maybe even sent to Rome for whatever it is that he did that was wrong. So we're, best we can tell is probably Onesimus met Paul in prison. Paul led Onesimus to the Lord and then he writes this letter to Philemon. That's how he knows Onesimus. Now, does he know Philemon? Well, that's probably even more of the question really to me. How does Paul know Philemon? Okay, well, a couple of things that we can say. In verse 5, it says, so he's talking to Philemon, he says in verse 5, Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Based on verse 5, it is likely that he just heard about Philemon. He didn't really know who that was. He never met him. Okay, he just heard about him. Uh, they do have some people that they, they know. If that's the case, then, then this is not really... I say a chance meeting with Onesimus, but it's probably not, okay? If, this, if that's the case, what we're suggesting is this, that Onesimus and Paul ends up leading Onesimus to the Lord while in prison. That has to be the case because Paul wasn't, he couldn't travel. That has to be the case. We have to, okay? So then if that's the case, he led him to the Lord while he was in prison. He listens to Onesimus, got to know him. And when he mentioned that he was from Colossae, and he mentioned this person named Philemon, well, then it's kind of a remarkable coincidence that, uh, that, that there was a church in Colossae and he finds about all, out about all these things. And there were people that traveled through and would tell him some things. They had a lot of mutual acquaintances and probably found out. He, I'm not saying he found out about the church from Onesimus, but likely he found out about Philemon because he was a church member of Colossae and then realized that this person that maybe they had a chance meeting with actually knows Philemon. 
kind of a remarkable thing. Now, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, something that we would say is by chance. Uh, that we would say the Lord, of course, orchestrated it. But there are a lot of people that, they, that are mentioned in Paul's other letters that are acquaintances here, too. He says in uh, verse 2, And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So Archippus, we believe, is the pastor of the church in Colossae. And then verse 23 and 24, there he mentions Epaphras and uh, Marcus. Of course, we know that. Marcus was uh, actually at the end of the book of Titus also, if I remember that right. Maybe I don't remember that right. Maybe not, sorry. But Marcus, then um, Aristarchus, Demas, we know he knew them. Lucas, and my, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Why would Paul mention these men's names if Philemon didn't actually know them? So they're acquaintances. He, lost, he has a lot of fellow acquaintance, people that they both know. <clears throat> the, there were Colossian people that visited Paul then uh, in Colossians 4, verses 10 and 18. Let's go there. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas. Maybe that's where I was thinking of it. Touching whom you receive commandments, and if he come unto you, receive him. And then, so there it's mentioned the same names that were in Philemon. And then verse 18, uh, it says there, and this is a salutation by, my, by the, the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds, grace be with you. Amen. At that point then, you'll, in some of your Bibles, it mentions who that was written to, and it mentions the name of Onesimus. So what we can say then is that there were a lot of Colossians that visited Paul. People from the church at Colossae had visited him, Arch Archippus and, Arch uh, and uh, some of these other names, visited Paul. So he wasn't unfamiliar with people from the church at Colossae. Probably these people went through seeking for Onesimus. Likely that was the case. So while he's in Rome, he writes a letter to, to, the, to, to the Colossian church, and uh, that was taken by Tychicus. And he writes a personal letter then to Philemon, telling him to accept Onesimus as he was now saved. Okay, so what happens then? Tychicus comes by. He writes a letter to Colossians. Maybe attached to that, uh, or an addendum, or whatever, is this epistle to Philemon. So he writes a personal letter. That's what makes Philemon pretty distinct. Is it's not really written to a church. This is not unique that way, but it is somewhat uh, distinct. But it was attached probably to the letter uh, to the church of Colossae, which he had never visited either. So he's, he's, he understands some things about this church by hearsay. And he writes to Philemon then. And we see in Philemon uh, verse 10, I beseech you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Okay, so uh, he leads him to the Lord. And so he writes this, then probably sends Onesimus with them, with the letter to Colossae and with the letter to Philemon, more than likely all at one time. And he asked the church in Colossae also to accept them. And he says there that Onesimus is among them. All right, so that, that's what we call uh, a fancy term in Greek. It's called an epistolary aorist. It simply means that the writer is writing in such a way that he's predicting that when they hear these things, events would have already happened. Anyway, um, so, this may be why, how, uh, I don't think Paul knew, personally knew Philemon, other people might agree with me, but it says they're hearing of my love and faith, of thy love and faith. Okay, so that's likely how it, how it, how it happened there. All right, so, there you have it. That's the, so we talk about the author, the date, the theme, and then some purposes, and this is pretty easy. It's a private letter, we mentioned that. He talks about the conversion of Onesimus. So part of the purpose then is to write, he want, he's wanting to write to this person, Philemon. <clears throat> and he tells about the conversion of Onesimus and he asks Philemon to forgive him. Something that might be interesting. How do we couch verse, um, verse 19 into this? He says, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. So he says, if anything needs to be repaid about Onesimus, I'll do it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. So if, if we said that Paul never met Philemon, why does Paul say to Philemon that he owes him? In what way? In what sense? What thinkest thou? 
I don't know. You're the teacher. <laughs> yes. I, I don't really know, but if he, Philemon, wouldn't be right with God if he didn't forgive Onesimus, and as Paul is telling, it's interesting to, to forgive that he needs to forgive Onesimus mm -hmm. that he someone kind of told him what told him what yeah. he needed to do. So he gave him the proper suggestion. So he owes him. Yeah, I think that's it. It's because of God's Word, because Paul wrote God's Word, and, it, and more than just in the epistle here to Philemon, of course, it's even the, the letter of the Colossae and some of the other letters that, that traveled around. So I think Paul here was, was indicating to Philemon that he owes him because of the letters that he wrote. Okay, let's look at some st statistics then, also about Philemon. It's kind of a funny thing. If Titus was the 56th book, Philemon then... 57, 59, 57th, right? All right, so there you have it. How many chapters? One. <laughs> so if I say, true or false, there are three chapters in Philemon. <laughs> if you put yes, then I'm going to kick you out of my class. Number three are 25 verses. I'm kidding. Four, how many words? Okay, here we go again. Guess. Three guesses, quickly. We've got time. Go ahead, say it. What is it? Somebody's trying to count them real quick. <laughs> 350. One more. 435. It is 445 words. Very close. Very good. Uh, there's one question. Unlike Titus, there is actually a question. Verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, special to me, but now how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So that word how there. So there's a question there, and no prophecy at all. All right, so in regards to the content then, it's not very much here, it's, it's uh, pretty straightforward. So, and then, <clears throat> so here we'll look at the, um, I guess, salutation. We'll look at that for just a second. And then secondly, we'll look at concern, the, uh, I guess we'll put here concerning Philemon, or maybe just Philemon. Thirdly, <coughs> the appeal of Paul. <coughs> and then fourthly, Paul's confidence. This is only a few verses each one, so we'll get through this quick. Paul's confidence. Okay, so first of all, the uh, salutation. So it says, verse 1, Paul, a she calls herself a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother. So he mentions Timothy. Unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Quite a few, quite a few very nice titles uh, given to Philemon, if indeed he didn't know, them, know him. All right, so... That's the salutation of Paul. Okay, now concerning Philemon, he says that he prays for him. Verse 4, I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. So I heard of Philemon, and uh, we get this from verse 5, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. So he prays for him. And then he, he's thankful for Philemon. So here we're, what we're talking about concerning Philemon tells him that he prays for him, and then he says that he thanks the Lord for his character. Verse 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So he calls him a brother. He thanks the Lord for this person's character and how, how he is an encourager among the saints. Um, and then uh, he also, of course, admit, he says that he prays for him. Quite a th few things. So he opens up the letter talking about his character, talking about how he, he uh, thanks the Lord for him, about how he is. And then the appeal of Paul. Okay, so then we get to the crux of it, kind of the meat of it. He, he admits that Onesimus has done something wrong. Verse 11, which in time past was to the unprofitable. So he, he, he acknowledges the unprofitableness, the aforementioned unprofitableness of Onesimus. Apparently, Onesimus fled to Rome because he was with Paul there. He says in verse 13, whom, for, verse 13, whom I would have retained with me, 
that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. All right, so um, there you have it. Onesimus fled then apparently to Rome. So now he's a, he's, a, he's a brother in Christ. Onesimus now is a saved person. He says in verse 16, it says there, Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So what is Paul suggesting? He's telling Philemon, Onesimus was unprofitable to you, but he was unsaved. Now he's saved. Now he's become, unprofit uh, he's become profitable to me. I'm going to send him to you so that he can be profitable to you. I want you to not treat him as a servant anymore, but I want you to treat him as a brother. It's a pretty high uh, expectation. So somebody that's been unprofitable to one, it could be defrauding, maybe he could have robbed them, who knows. In some way unprofitable, Paul is saying that through his conversion, now, conversion, now he merits you treating him as a brother. Pretty high, tall order. Then he says, receive him, receive him well. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. So it goes even further. He wants, he wants, he wants Philemon to receive Onesimus as if he was receiving Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote these letters, who undoubtedly Philemon knew of. <clears throat> okay, and in verse 19, Kenneth reaffirms that I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me. Okay, so he even says, I'll repay those things. Whatever it is that you, you think that he needs to own up to, put that on my account. Beautiful letter, really. Uh, Paul is, is being completely um, open. Very, he's, very, very, he's suggesting a high level of forgiveness. All right, and then last, last, two ver last few verses. The, I guess I should have done it wrong here. Uh, so we talked about concerning Philemon. So these things concerning Philemon dealt with his character. And then the appeal of Paul. What does Paul want Philemon to do in regards to Onesimus? We talked about that. And then Paul's confidence. Uh, he's confident that Philemon is going to obey. Verse 20, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Funny, is it? That's, I don't like as funny as the word. But interesting, he says, I know you're going to do even more than I say. Maybe that's a suggestion. Maybe he's trying to use the power of suggestion there, but I don't, I don't know. But he has a certain confidence in Philemon that he'll do these things. And then uh, he, is, he believes that he'll be freed from his imprisonment. Verse 22, But withal prepare me also a lodging, for I trust <clears throat> that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. This is why we say it's his first imprisonment. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, so he knows about, of Epaphras. Apparently he was released at some time. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas. Okay, and then he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Um, he says, the Grace be with you all in Titus. Amen. So a, a very similar, uh, what we might say, benediction. Okay. Any questions? I didn't think so. <laughs> Have a great day.